welcome to the Using Technology in Immersive Worlds and Live Action Role Play panel. Um, uh, thank you very much for coming. What's going to happen is first, I'm going to be talking very quickly because, again, we have a lot of stuff to go over. And there's giveaways as well. Hopefully, you guys already got one of our giveaways, which is passes to the Puzzlearium Escape Room, courtesy of Steven and Streeper. Uh, that's what one of those is, so you can check that out. That's here in San Diego. Um, so what's going to happen, I'm going to introduce our panel, and then I'm going to explain live action role playing as quickly as I can. And then, oh, there I am. Thank you. Uh, oh, round of applause, guys, for the, for the volunteers of San Diego Comic Con. These guys, honestly, honestly, all the guys that are working here, the volunteers that are doing this, they're so good at keeping things moving. I mean, these are like the crowd control lines, the AV, all the stuff. These guys are doing a ton of work to make sure that this massive 167,000 fan awesomeness works. So, you know, thank your, thank your uh, volunteers and everything. And thank you, volunteers. Okay, um, I'm gonna talk about live action role playing, um, and then I'm gonna segue into a little bit of technology in LARP and how it's being used. We're gonna hear from Matthew Webb. Uh, he's gonna be talking about uh, the Planetfall app and mobile technology. Kristen Brumley, oh, she's actually right next to her, will show off some swords and wands from Fort Ivy's uh, legacy system. Then Maya, oh, you guys sat in order, this is great. Maya will show a video from the event Horizon LARP and talk about the Discord server. Brent Haining will show off some parts of the Starship Selkit LARP, uh, followed by Stevenson, Streeper, and Puzzlearium. I'm also gonna show you guys some videos that just came out from some magic staffs. A company's making magic staffs, and they wanna get a little feedback, so you guys can give some feedback on what you think of these. Finally, we're gonna have time for Q&A and uh, an amazing giveaway that will be really cool. So stick around, uh, someone's gonna be happy. So Matthew Webb is the lead developer of the software studio Incognita Limited in Austin, Texas. He does both game design and software engineering and has worked professionally with clients ranging from the Washington National Opera to the Department of Defense. He created Incognita Limited to explore the possibilities te of technology in live action gaming three years ago. Matthew has been described as the go-to guy for incorporating technology into live action play, according to fiasco creator Jason Morningstar. And, quote, the expert on augmented reality tech in LARPing, unquote, by professional LARP organizer and writer Ben Schwartz. In 2017, Matthew has worked with integrating mobile technology into live action gaming with White Wolf Publishing, makes makers of Vampire the Masquerade, and has become the official software partner for Legacy Game Systems' Daemon Augmented Reality Gaming Platform. He's also an author, writing articles on both technology and LARP and on general LARP theory. Matthew Webb. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. Kristen Brumley runs Kate Gollum Productions, a company that produces LARP entertainment, including the web series Basic Adventuring 101, which you should totally check out on YouTube, Basic Adventuring 101. Since 2014, Kate Gollum Productions expanded and now provides digital marketing services to LARP and geek-related companies like Epic Armory and Legacy Game Systems. She's been LARPing since 2009 and travels constantly, experiencing new games and meeting some of the coolest people worldwide. Kristen Brumley. Maya Ziv is the de Director of Technology at Event Horizon, a sci-fi LARP experience based in the Bay Area. She coordinates the development and utilization of their large mechanical set pieces and all in-world communications, as well as any other cool sci-fi tech they might want brought to life. She has been playing and writing LARPs for four years and teaching workshops with a Wayfinder experience for three. She is currently an engineering student at Stanford University. Maya Ziv. Brent Haining is the founder of Toy Shop Systems LLC, a creative systems engineering design and fabrication workshop. The Toy Shop team is known as artists, storytellers, makers, and go-to engineers for making unusual dreams into reality. Toy Shop is becoming well-known for high-end, sophisticated special effects costumes involving multi-layers of technology, including LED lighting, lasers, video, fog, and more. They're actively involved in the space tourism industry, designing and engineering solutions for an array of hospitality-related needs. Projects and clients of note include touring production props for Destroyed, Metallica, Motley Crue, Aerosmith, art installations at major festivals such as Coachella and Burning Man, unique stage and screen experiences such as Sci-Fi Channel's Robot Combat League, 
The Super Bowl halftime show with the Black Eyed Peas in Eurovision 2012 in Baku, Azerbaijan for the country of Austria. Brent himself is a uh, member of Yahtzee Local 44 in Hollywood and has been featured for his work creating wearable technology for Tron Legacy. Brent is a special effects systems design engineer with over two decades of production experience. From Star Wars and the Matrix trilogy to The Dark Knight Rises and the latest release of Star Trek Into Darkness. He engineers models, spaceships, high-tech costumes, and unique props for movies, events, concert touring, art installations, and spectacles. Brent Haney. And down at the end of the table there is Stevenson Streeper, the owner, founder, and grand puzzle master of the Puzzlearium, San Diego's first mostly non-lethal escape room facility. So now you totally want to use your passes, which opened in October 2014. Since then, he and his team has welcomed almost 50,000 guests, opened two escape rooms, and recently opened a new real-world game called The Floor is Lava, which is a great name. Uh, a werewolf mafia-inspired game of murdering your friends and lying to them in a lake of lava. Now as Puzzlearium is creating large format escape rooms and mega games for dozens and even hundreds of people at once here in San Diego. His qualifications include HTML, Microsoft Word, almost making a roller coaster once, half a bachelor's degree, and a knack for writing self-aggrandizing bios for Aaron to read to the public. No. Stevenson Schrieber. <laughs> And lastly, I am Aaron Bannock. Hi. I've been LARPing for almost 30 years and have designed and co-designed interactive experiences for the West Hollywood Book Fair, the Girl Scouts of America, the Paul Bien Library in Rancho Cucamonga, Texas State University, UCLA Game Lab, San Rio, and two for the downtown San Diego Public Library. If anyone actually played these, I'd love it if you raise your hand. One was called Bookworm, with the worms eating the books, and the other one was f uh, called Something Wicked This Way, which was part of their uh, Shakespeare First Folio exhibit. By the way, did anyone actually who's in San Diego play those? It would have been awesome if I talked to you. Okay. Um, my last uh, creation was a disaster preparation spontaneous leadership event for the city of Palo Alto. I'm the co-creator of the LARP Census, former editor of LARP World Magazine, former co-editor of the Weird Con Companion Book, vice president of the Game Academy, a 501c3 charity based in the Bay Area that develops and runs after school and summer camp educational role playing and LARP experiences. Uh, in June, I directed and produced my first play, a staged adaptation of the Nordic LARP Fallen Stars. This fall, I will resume teaching design and game design for a private school and a homeschool learning center in Beverly Hills, and I love the educational possibilities of live action role playing. That's me. Thank you. I want to say real quick, I, I'm sorry that Ford Ivy couldn't be here. He was here last year. Uh, he had some family issues to attend to, but Ford Ivy is here in spirit, and we'd like to uh, give Ford Ivy a round of applause for not being here. Creator of Legacy Systems, founder of Nero. Woo. Thank you, guys. Okay, um, so I want to get into real quick, uh, and I'm, I timed this out to be like four minutes, 59 seconds. So this is a very quick explanation of uh, live action role playing. For those, even if you do know what this is, sit tight for this. It's only about five minutes. So. Definition of live action role playing. Um, the, you can get, you can ask five people what it means, uh, live action role playing, you'll get like six or seven definitions. So this is mine. Um, yours might dif uh, d uh, disagree. So I have three pillars or criteria that I apply to activities to check and see if it's a LARP. These are from my essay, uh, Cooler Than You Think, Understanding Live Action Role Playing, which you can get on drive through RPG. So. The first one is that in a LARP, everyone is both an active participant and an audience member. Uh, you watch and react to others. The others watch and react to you. It's uncommon in traditional theater for the audience to watch and react to each other, but with this new immersive, interactive, escape room hybrid thing that it is, you're getting a little more of that. So that's actually me at Legion in Czech, where uh, I marched around in the snow for two days and fired a revolver with blanks. It was actually really cool. Um, Second pillar that determines if something's a live action role playing is that participants perform their actions, they don't narrate them. So you aren't sitting at a table narrating your actions to tell a story. I kind of think of that as the same way as a computer screen. If you're moving your avatar on a computer screen, it's kind of a way of narrating. You're going through a medium to do it. Um, TSR, which you guys know created Dungeons and Dragons, made a deliberate and intentional point to differentiate D&D from LARPing especially after the apocry apocryphal account of the disappearance of James Dallas Egbert III, which was further fictionalized in the book and movie 
uh, TV movie Mazes and Monsters starring Tom Hanks. <laughs> so if you see that, it had a really bad effect on LARPing and TSR, makers of D&D, kind of separated role-playing games from LARPing and it hurt LARPs for a while. That's a friend of ours at a Limbo game. Uh, Limbo is a LARP set at Tiki Bar in Hell that my wife designed and he's juggling fire. <laughs> so the third pillar is participants constantly define and redefine the fictional space. And this one's actually critical. This one's really important. It's up to you, the participants, who are both audience members and actors, with your imaginations and your actions, you're making this fictional space where everything inside the space may not be exactly what it really is. And everyone in that space may not be exactly who they are. The space could be as small as an apartment bathroom or as large as planet Earth, which alternate reality games use a lot, though, if it's a planet-wide ARG. But it's up to everyone to agree, for example, that, as in this picture, we're really space cadets aboard a spaceship, not Worldcon attendees walking around a Hilton hotel with yellow rope around our waists. So in reality, they're walking around a Hilton with a yellow rope, but in the fiction, that's a spaceship that they're inside. What you have to do is you have to keep the rope taut to maintain the, uh, the ship. So um, I believe live action role playing started very long ago. It's part of communal performance art, such as reenacting the hunt, uh, moved to war games, and in the classical period, uh, in the uh, late Renaissance, the Commedia dell'art in Italy, where character actors would improvise stories with a crowd that would gather for an impromptu performance. It also includes mock trials, the Model UN Club, the Boy Scouts in Russia also resemble LARPs, and there's many, many, many more examples. Uh, this right here is an awesome photo from a 1941 Life Magazine article about a science fiction LARP run by a University of Nebraska student called Atzor. And if you Google Atzor, A-T-Z-O-R, you can read this, but they're basically like, uh, emperor and empress of a planet, everybody controls planets, and it's a total LARP in 1941. So features of LARPs. There's so many different features and facets to each LARP that a, a helpful way of thinking about them is like an audio mixing desk with variable dials, sorry, dials that designers can set or even adjust on the run. One of the most common differences in a LARP is either a recurring campaign or a one-shot. This is one of the big, big differences you'll hear about LARPs. Does this go like once a month, once every two months, or does it happen once and done? So is it like a TV series, or is it like a movie? Um, sometimes there's a sequel. Other variables are who makes the characters? Do the designers make the characters? Do you make the characters? Are there a lot of rules, or a very simple few ones? Is there a rigid plot, or is it more sandbox freeform to explore? Tons of room in between. We can go to this, but we're not. So genres, I want to emphasize there's many, many, many different genres of content in LARP as they're at a Comic-Con. Fantasy, uh, science fiction, horror, Western, steampunk, dramatic, romance, musical, short, experimental, anything you can think of, there can be a LARP of this. So like that was from the Muppets, the Yip Yips, steampunk, uh, that was a Harry Potter one I did. The bottom one was a drama called Paratarts. Middle one is an experimental one called White Death, and the last one was for a fantasy LARP at a uh, LARP convention. So one thing when you think on uh, LARP content, I like to say that fantasy campaigns are to LARP as superheroes are to comic books. So if you think, if I say, oh, comic books, well, that means superheroes. If you know anything about comic books, you know there's much, much, much more to it. Same thing with LARPs. Okay, almost done. Alternate exp uh, reality experiences, et cetera. So this is coming in really big now. This is, there's a lot of stuff coming with this. Um, most of the time in these escape rooms, immersive theater, alternate reality experiences or games, you're playing yourself, you're you, but you're in a fictional world, right? You're like Alice, in, uh, Alice down the rabbit hole. Um, usually in LARPs you have a character most of the time, um, and a lot of the alternate reality experiences spend a lot of their effort uh, creating an atmosphere, immersing you in this world. So what you see here, taste, touch, feel, smell, uh, is created. In LARPs, they're kind of more interested in you being someone else. So they give you a lot of rules for you being something else. Um, so like a spaceship is yellow rope around someone, something like that. Um, some immersive plays allow you to view at your own control uh, or pace like which actor to follow. Sleep No More in New York is famous for that. Did anyone go to Sleep No More in New York? Yay, Sleep No More is amazing. Um, it's very close to LARPing. 
Uh, others allow the audience to interact with the actors of varying degrees. Halloween haunts, when you go to a haunted house, all, it's on the border of uh, uh, live action theater, uh, live action role playing, immersive theater. So overall, live action role playing is an art form, I think, a medium of expression, and all its siblings are a massive collection of activities under the banner of performance art. The borders between each, like between immersive theater and LARP, or LARP and role playing games are very blurry. They're blurring more, and more and more people are crossing between to see what happens on the other side, which is awesome. It's a, it's a beautiful time to be in the live action role playing, stuff like that. So, technology and LARP and immersive experiences. Uh, this photo is from a steampunk LARP I did aboard the Queen Mary, and what you're looking at is a Macintosh SE running a hypercard stack that was an encyclopedia that players could look on things with a lot of decorations around it. Um, technology is increasingly playing a large part of interactive experiences. One of the most important tools is just the internet, but mobile phones are in there, and the technology is helping in a lot of ways, not just for designers to design, keep track of characters, plots, but also for the designers to talk to the designers, to the players, to the players to talk, things like that. But it's also being used to immerse, to add to that immersion of being in another world. So, let us talk more about technology in LARP by Matthew Webb. How's it going? Thank you. So, uh, my name is Matthew Webb, and I'll give him a second to do this there. That's great. Um, I'm the founder and lead developer of a studio called Incognito Limited, and I've been graced with many kind words, which you read out. And I'm just going to go through what we're doing, the things I have seen done, and kind of how I got to be talking to you here right now. So, uh, to begin with, in the real world, I am a uh, software engineer for a major defense and simulations designer and contractor. I uh, Basically, I support ward games and live training exercises throughout the world, having to deal with both emergency services and military exercises. So pretty much I get to train soldiers with tanks that have laser tag on them, which is kind of one of the coolest jobs ever. Um, and this is augmented reality. This is perhaps one of the first examples you can get is the military exercise or the war game and the fact that we overlay a fictional world over the real world and have computers reacting real time to the actions of soldiers with basically the most expensive laser tag rigs you've ever seen. <laughs> and my hobby is slightly different. Uh, on my off hours, I like to dress up in weird clothes, act like I'm someone else, and get into fights with my friends um, while losing touch with reality. Uh, you know, live action role playing. Um, the differences between augmented and alternate reality, I'll offer my own example, uh, definition because that's what you have to do in these talks, uh, is to I direct and act and try to emotionally embody someone else. I'm playing a character. And that is the biggest difference between the two, in my opinion, is that I am attempting to do that. You might want to dress up like Ash if you're playing Pokemon Go. That sounds like a lot of fun, but it is not core to the gameplay. So therefore, Pokemon Go is an augmented reality game, but it is not a LARP. Next slide, please. Um, so this is how I put them together. I decided to found a company called Incognito Limited because I decided it might be cool to see how you could put tech and LARP together. So Incognito Limited's business is we just make software for LARPs. We make augmented reality apps for phones, online character management software, and mobile games with wands and weapons and all sorts of cool stuff, uh, which we'll talk about uh, later. Uh, but we aren't the only ones making software, but I think we're the only ones making, uh, making LARP-only software. And occasionally we get to justify playing around with some really cool toys. That is a VR demo we did at an actual LARP park outside of Austin. So our first project was a game called Planetfall, which we created with an engine we designed called Axiom. Axiom is uh, used Planetfall as its test bed and is the first mobile driven LARP where most of the mechanics are handled slowly, solely through a mobile phone. The uh, Axiom engine is a mobile app joined with an online server. The online component handles character creation and management and the mobile app component handles everything from economic actions to health countdowns. You scan things in the real world, you get actions and information based on what character you're playing. 
So it is a fully interactive game engine. What happened when we started doing Planetfall is that the technology made the world live on its own in a way that really surprised us. We really saw the potential. Usually in most LARP games, you're not dealing with a very high-tech environment. You, uh, information, challenges, and events are managed by staff members or by index cards or open this envelope if you have skill B. Here, the software interacts with the environment. You scan things, you know what your character knows. It allows you to simulate knowing things you do not and allows us to give a depth of information that usually wouldn't be available. And each character has their own skills and abilities that integrate with the world in an interesting way. If we fast forward to May of 2017 in Berlin, Germany, uh, we encounter, we start working on another project called LARP Weaver in which we built the world of darkness in a way that was pretty unprecedented. White Wolf Publishing is preparing and is to launch a new edition of Vampire of the Masquerade and their seminal World of Darkness line. At World of Darkness Berlin convention, their partners in the participation design agency, who was our client and good friends in that, uh, decided that they were going to do something extremely ambitious and we were brought in to help them. They decided to run a one night game throughout Berlin, renting out nightclubs throughout East Berlin's club district. And they were going to bring in over 250 players from everywhere from Australia to America to Russia to play in a single night. You can imagine how much of a problem that was. Everyone needs characters. They need backgrounds. They need who to, they're playing with. They need instructions on how to play. They know they need to check in to say that who they're going. You're managing 250 players over a two square mile area in surrounded by mundanes who don't know what's going on. So we had to create a guide and a way to guide 250 players to create the secret world of Berlin in this beloved, uh, beloved setting. So we created LARP Weaver. LARP Weaver um, guided everyone to get the characters they wanted, distributed information, and just made the game run. Uh, and one of my good friend, uh, Johanna Peterson, who wrote, was the main writer, said he simply would not have been able to do it with the soft, without the software. This, all, this simplified running a 250 person game to the point that it could even be possible. So because of their efforts and because the excellent writing team, we ran a night in East Berlin in which we had, you, ha you have not lived until you've seen 250 black, black clad vampire players <laughs> storming through the club sections of Berlin. That is, that was the best experience ever and everyone had a blast and they chose the characters they wanted, they found out what they wanted to do and they got it months ahead of time and they costumed up and they made it great. And they were all super fans and it, it was a fantastic thing. Our satisfaction rate with the characters from that event was uh, 92%. And if, uh, if you ever talk to a LARP organizer, nine out of 10 of your players being happy is pretty damn good. So where is this going? Um, for our part, the technology is going to be, we're opening up the gates of the technology in a big way. Uh, we are going to be helping more and more games using the tech that we've developed throughout the world. Every one of those little white dots is a game in the next uh, one to two years that we're negotiating with to run their stuff through our software. And we're going to be blending together our original engine Axiom and LARP Weaver together so that we can have these giant interactive experiences where your characters are chosen by you, created by you, and you interact with the world seamlessly, and you can have hundreds of players without ever talking to a GM, which is very different than a typical LARP setup. And our biggest story is that, and we just think this deal a few days ago, is that Ford Ivy's Legacy Game Systems has a, an incredible augmented reality vest and rig that interacts with weapons and scanners and props of all sorts. They call the Daemon platform. 
and they have contacted us and we're going to be des designing the games that will run on it. This is not a software or a, a piece of hardware for any one particular game, but has become, is designed as a piece of technology that will allow us to take all the nuance and depth and, and incredible information that comes with, say, an MMO or Pokemon Go and turn it into an actual physical, uh, a physical experience in an incredible way. And Kristen is going to talk about that. Hi, guys. So my name is Kristen, and as we've already said, um, I am from Legacy Game Systems. And we are basically taking the really cool software capabilities and putting it into hardware that allows you to interact with the world in a more immersive way. So for instance, right now we're working on a game called Spell Slingers where, uh, where you've got actual wands instead of like, a, like in a laser tag situation where you've got a gun, you've got a wand, you have different buttons, different spells that you can cast. There will be gestures, so like gestures? Yeah. You can wave your hand in certain ways and certain spells will go off. Um, and so it allow you essentially to simulate um, like having a, a wand duel in real life without um, it being just pretend or, or like you know playing in a video game or something. You're in real life, how cool is that? So what we've developed, first of all, is the, the hardware that goes into such things as wands. Um, it's also going to work in things like swords, um, I mean guns too, pretty much like any sort of weapon that you could use in a, in a fight situation. Um, and then that's going to uh, basically communicate with things, these little sensors that go on your body, they Velcro in certain spots, uh, it'll detect who you've hit, um, who hit who, what your, hit H, H, uh, your HP is, and it's all going to be basically tracked on your phone. So as you're playing, uh, you're going to look down and be like, oh, I'm dead. <laughs> or, <laughs> or maybe I'm, I, I lived, I lived. Um, or I'm out of mana, or you know, all, all those sorts of things. Um, and the, the versatility that we're going to have, uh, as he mentioned, we're not just doing things like um, spell casting or like fantasy. We're also doing things like zombie, zombies. Um, uh, we're working on one LARP where as you use skills, um, your skill is going to increase. So as you use your sword, you'll get better with it, you'll cause more damage, which would be like the same thing in real life. And then as you don't use it, you'll decrease in skill. So um, it's basically taking the things that you've always kind of wanted to have in a LARP, uh, but never could because of the, um, the mechanics, being able to track it in your head, being able to um, make that work in like a game, like rule system. Um, and taking it a step further, so I, I'm also uh, working with Epic Armory, and we are taking this, this hardware and this software and making it look good, because nobody likes to LARP and look not good. We want to look good while we're doing it. So um, working on things, uh, we're actually developing costuming so that we can disguise the sensors. They don't look so weird while they're on your costume. Um, and then also developing um, cases for the wands uh, so that they'll look pretty spiff and not just 3D printed. Um, <laughs> and we've also got things, uh, in terms of Epic Armory, I don't know if you are all familiar, but we are one of the largest like LARP gear creators in the world. We're based out of Denmark. And uh, actually, if you want to, later I have so many of these catalogs if anybody wants one, but we have a ton of stuff. Um, including our new stronghold weapons. So this is another cool technology right now. Technology is not just um, about uh, necessarily like the software and like circuitry. It's also what you use to create stuff, right? So in the past, your LARP weapons were made out of PVC pipe and a little bit of foam, some duct tape. Um, now we've got stuff that requires absolutely no maintenance. It's extremely lightweight. Um, our stronghold weaponry, basically, um, it's the top of the line LARP weapon that you can get right now. So uh, check it out as well if you want to come over and afterwards pick it up, feel it. Uh, feel free to do so. But anyway, so making things look good and, you know, making LARP all the more immersive. That's us. And thank you, Kristen. Uh, Maya here has a presentation on the Event Horizon LARP. Yes, 
Uh, hello, everyone. I am Maya. I'm one of the event orga organizers for uh, Event Horizon LARP, which was a three-day blockbuster LARP that happened in Marin Headlands near San Francisco in the Bay Area in April. Uh, it's, it was a sci-fi LARP. Think Star Wars, but not actually Star Wars because we sure can't afford that licensing. Um, <laughs> And it's basically the premise was that these colonists were going to, they, they had found this new planet called Phalos 3, and all of these colonists from different planets in the galaxy, refugees from a war, were coming and were colonizing this planet. So can you show the next slide? So they came together uh, in the midst of politics and uh, mega corporations fighting over property and you know all the sorts of drama that colonists might have and came together to establish a new government on this planet. Uh, but one of the things that is, of course, critical for sci-fi is an element of, of technology and of mystery. So as organizers, we wanted it to be a lot about, you know, the politics of starting a new planet, but we also wanted it to be a lot about the, the sci-fi and the technology and the, the mystery of exploring a new galaxy. Because one of the critical parts of this world is that there were these ancient humans with a bunch of ancient technology that had been left behind that nobody knew how it really worked. So we worked really hard to create this set piece that was basically a relic of ancient technology to uh, add another level of depth to this sci-fi world so that uh, people really felt immersed. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we have a, a small video of what happened. Uh, you saw the corner of it. My sir is again in. I will stress this. If this is a mistake, I take full responsibility in help. our lives. <laughs> Uh, that statement is not officially endorsed by the university. Please do not move forward. Nobody move. Something is inside. Oh, my God. It's a person. What? It's a Incoming. And we were all attacked after that. <laughs> yeah, uh, what you didn't see was the robots with swords coming out of the trees trying to harvest people immediately afterwards. Um, so that was a real video of the scene uh, in the LARP. It was the last day, it was our big finale, when they put in the code that they discovered by uh, you know, unraveling these ancient relics and learning their language and open up this orb, which, as they found out, contained an evil alien AI in it, uh, which was trying to catalog all the people on the planet and found a bunch of people who were unregistered and really didn't like that and really, in, really felt that they were intruders. Um, but you know, over the course of the game, they figured out how to talk to it, figured out what it needed, and made it friendly, and all got registered in the database. That was the final scene. Um, but this, this orb was our main set piece. It's six feet uh, in diameter. It's a bunch of uh, laser-cut metal panels that uh, Angelo Taylor, our incredible, incredible mechanist who built this thing, uh, made in his workshop. And it took like eight months of work, this is, this is what you can do when you have a budget. This is one of the things that's, <laughs> LARPs do not generally have budgets. It's, that's a new thing for us. But um, one of the really wonderful things that Event Horizon was able to tap into was this culture of like maker spaces. So you can go to the next slide. Um, and, and, and maker culture is, is, has been around for a long time. People really love to make stuff. And when you have people who are passionate about making things and people who are passionate about experiences and about doing things, the intersection of those is really, really cool. Because it, you, it means you can make these awesome set pieces that light up and play noise and contain evil alien AIs. And you can get the sort of full scale like set design that feels like it's on a movie scene. So uh, this was our, our beautiful, beautiful centerpiece for Event Horizon that we're really proud of. And we're very excited to see how the intersection of makerspaces and LARP can go forward into the future and keep working with Angelo Taylor. He is uh, incredible. Uh, yeah. So next thing that I'm going to very briefly walk you through uh, is uh, you may have heard of Discord. Dis Discord is a wonderful, wonderful company that does basically gaming uh, uh, like communications platform, so like the same way uh, gamers really like to be talking, uh, you know, through their uh, through some sort of, of chat while they're playing, so that you can talk to people in the game. Um, and Discord is one of the really big free providers for that. So if you go to the next slide, um, but it also has a very beautiful sci-fi aesthetic. 
So uh, we we discovered Discord in our in our search to keep our players communicated and thought that it was a really beautiful fit. So you can see all of the channels on the side. You can see that's the the main chat right after people uh, realized that they weren't in fact going to die and, and had uh, made the AI friendly again. But um, one of the coolest things, especially for me in LARPs, is when the world feels like people are very active in it and able to communicate. Because when you can get information across faster, it means that people stay up to date, they feel more involved, and therefore feel more immersed. So I know that Matthew talked about that a little bit too. Communications are huge in LARPs. You have to find a way for information to spread. Um, so you, we created this wonderful Discord server. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And, uh, and I'll, I'll take you through basically the mechanics of how it works. So Discord's platform, basically the way it works is it has individual channels. Channels are like chat rooms. If you've used Slack, it's very similar, um, where you, there's individual chat rooms, which we set up to be basically different roles in the game, so different groups like politician groups or like the Colony News Bulletin, which is our, our news reporter group for the game, uh, and each of them had their own channel. So then if you go to the next slide, there's also in parallel these things called roles. And roles are essentially like tags that you give to people, saying, okay, this is a thing that you are. Uh, so for instance, you're a col colonial news bulletin uh, writer. You are uh, one of the politicians from the Galactic League, et cetera, et cetera. And if you go to the next slide. Um, then basically what you can do is for each of the channels, you can assign permissions. And that lets, uh, you basically get to pick which roles can see which channels. So that actually, I, I was a, a little turned off by how complicated it was to set up at the beginning, but it actually allows for a lot of really cool, um, you can do different crossings between different groups of like who can see what, you can have overarching mod uh, groups that can see everything, and it's a, really, uh, it's a really beautiful system for making sure that people can stay connected in game. Uh, my favorite example of this being that the um, mods of the game, so the people who were sitting and sending out non-player characters to go interact with people, trying to keep the plot running, we have no other way of getting information other than sending out spies, which is not efficient, don't try it. Um, so we actually sat there uh, in the, one of our favorite things to do, like in the GM lobby, was just scroll through the Colonial News Bulletin and see what antics our uh, colonists had gotten up to in that moment. Um, so. Yeah, Discord is great. If you're interested in learning more, you can go to uh, support.discordapp.com and read their advanced community server setup. And uh, yeah, it, it's a communications very critical for LARPs. Discord is a great option. And uh, thank you for listening. Yay. <laughs> All right. So I know I know we're behind time, so I'm going to cut my own time uh, talking about Selkit because I know we're running quickly. So Starship Selkit Wave 1 at Wave 1 LARP, uh, you have postcards for it, is a blockbuster LARP that I'm going to be doing um, aboard the SS Lane Victory in San Pedro in the port of Los Angeles. Uh, it was a, a merchant marine ship that launched in World War II near the end. It served in the Korean War and the Vietnam War. Um, and we're going to be turning that into a spaceship. Uh, it's going to be about roughly a four-hour experience. It's about $150. We're going to be using professional actors that will role play alongside you. Uh, and this is all part of the Game Academy, which is a 501c3 nonprofit that I mentioned. Crowdfunding expected soon. So I want to show some pictures. This is the ship, uh, the Lane Victory, docked. It actually works. If the engines are working, it would sail around, but we're not going to sail around because gas is expensive. Um, this is the decks. We're going to take take over the whole ship, so it's it's all of us. Uh, so you're not going to see anybody on the ship that's not either working for it or someone involved in it. Um, these are the guns that can be fired, uh, along with that one, the cannon. Um, this is in the engine room, which is like four stories, so we'll have engineers running around the engine room. This communications room, that's, uh, we'll be talking about communications. These are two photos from the hallways, one in the engine room on the right, and then the decks on the left. Um, I did a promotional video, but because I did not cut it yet, um, I only have some still photos from it. So soon, soon, as soon as I get back, I'm going to cut a promotional video. But I want to show this off. These are pictures uh, of Stephanie Shea. And Stephanie Shea, I have to mention, um, she's a voiceover artist uh, with over 350 credits, some of which you might have heard of. She's worked on Little Witch Academia, DC Superhero Girl. She's the voice of Katana, Halo Wars 2, Final Fantasy 15. She's the voice of a character named Sailor Moon. I don't know if any of you heard of Sailor Moon. In Sailor Moon Crystal, Super Moon S. And she's a role, she also has a role in um, last year's blockbuster hit, Your Name. 
Uh, has anyone seen Your Name? It's the highest grossing animated movie of all time. She's one of the voices in that. So she's interested in being in the LARP. She was in the promo. And what she's holding is a panel that I'm going to show you in just a second. So in the video, this is sort of the example of the tech that we're going to use on the left. That was a broken panel that had to be repaired. And I'll show it to you in just a second. You had to replace one of the um, tubes. It's got a red light. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, and if you replace it, it would complete a circuit and we'd get green lights. And on the right is uh, Stephanie and Shauna Waldron, who I've known for years. Uh, Shauna famously played Rick Moranis' daughter, Becky Icebox O'Shea, in the movie Little Giants. And she was Michael Douglas's daughter, Lucy, in The American President, along with many, many, many other movies and TV shows. So they're both interested in being with us. Um, so, uh, and I want to talk to Brent, because now we have show and tell for you guys. I know we're running late, so we're going to go quickly. So Brent, do you want to bring out a show and tell and tell us what you just made? Well, hello. Uh, Brent Haining. We do a lot of things with the uh, uh, film and uh, television world. Uh, mostly props, models, miniatures, things, special effects, and gadgets, and goofball things like that. You know, from uh, all the small movies nobody's heard of, like Star Wars, Star Trek, and things like that. <laughs> so you start getting into the craft uh, that pushes the story, which brings it into how I was talking to Aaron about with the storyline and such like that, where the a, a vehicle that is story driven. How do you develop the sets, the props, the effects, the designs, the games, the puzzles, which flows into what you're going into. But um, if you can come up with assembling, uh, if you're yourselves trying to do this sort of crafting, I was trying to think, what would I do? And say, like, oh, I'll build it not in a shop where I have endless amount of equipment and things, uh, but maybe gathered parts and then on the kitchen table just come up with something that can be influential but also drive a point. So if you have a, a box, these are great pelican boxes and such like that. They're actually factory not too far away and uh, not too expensive. So, But they look that technical, you know, get away for military LARP or some other. So, But it's a nice waterproof enclosure for holding whatever. So whatever includes just you can have uh, whatever and you put it together but the noise of the nothing plus the some things and the gadgets and the things and the stuff well orchestrated becomes a thing so when you want to uh, suddenly have it go you can have it uh, do unusual things and have circuits so maybe when they the characters open up this archaic thing and, oh my god it's still doing you have an extra storyline part this can be simple nothings there's only a handful of parts in this one but i only spent a, a few hours dealing with it um, if you have a few days dealing with it and something other and you get your idea, then the concept that it's not actually that challenging as long as you have your ideas straight, write them down and figure out what that flows. It's puzzle solving. What do I look, I, I have a shape. I, I, I want to make this into a sub, so I'll just cut it here. And things are not exactly as you see them here, but you can turn them into because you're all crafty and creative people or you wouldn't be LARPing, right? So the, uh, if you cut th some parts, that gets you a lens, that gets you a thing, and oh, this, you won't mind if I take this off, and then put that in there, you know, so it just gets, what is around you that you can use in your house, at your work, you know, provided it doesn't shut the work down. And the, uh, uh, don't do that. Um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, there's a lot of ways that you can provide your storyline with really attractive movie level props if you just take the care and the vision and see it through. No, there's everything on YouTube I think now. I figured out how to fix my car on YouTube, it's great. Uh, so there's all kinds of that sort of thing um, on how to build, how to come up with a thing, a puzzle piece, a thing that will move your scene into something even more desirable that people want to keep coming back to your story. Part of the, this is one of the ones, same thing that we're working with Brent. This is one of the pieces we used for the photo shoot and the, or the video shoot. And the idea was that this was uh, a broken, oops, um, uh, it's not gonna stay. Um, one of these tubes busted. So Mark Mensch made this and he's got a description of it. Essentially what Stephanie has to do is she takes this 
part out, runs up to engineer and replaces it. And when all, I don't have batteries in it, so the lights weren't gone, but there's three lights here, top and bottom. Once all these tubes, uh, this metal top uh, makes the connection, it'll turn to green. So the lights are red, but if you make the connection with all three tubes, they'll turn green. That's it. So this panel comes off. That. But this one will come off, so you can, the idea is that as, uh, as a player, go back, um, you're actually able to do something. The idea is that I like that you as players are actually doing something instead of using cards or numbers or something like that. You're actually doing something physical with it. So we'll let you guys play with this. I know our time is going quick, and I have not given us enough time to Steven Sh Stevenson Schrieper um, to talk about the Puzzlearium. So I want to get to that real quick. So that's coming up on Starship Selco. We're essentially looking at stuff where you're actually doing uh, things, which will be happening here um, with the Puzzlearium. Stevenson. Right, Yo. So like I said, uh, I'm Stevenson Streeper. Um, and I, and um, as I said before, I made Puzzlearium, which was San Diego's first escape rooms. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know what escape rooms are, uh, who are you? Because I <laughs> haven't found you. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, they, uh, they were an absolutely big, uh, huge media bump phenomenon um, b uh, about uh, summer of last year, thereabouts. Um, but nevertheless, um, uh, before all that happened, um, uh, we opened our, our puzzle rooms about uh, three or so years ago um, in order to create um, real world gaming. Um, of course, not strictly LARPing in the specific sense, in the sense that there is technically no role playing in it. Um, that being said, it is still very much the same thing. Now, I know you're looking at that right now and you're thinking, wow, that doesn't look like an escape room. And you're right, it's not. Um, uh, that's because um, that is our new game, The Floor is Lava, which doesn't transition well, but I, ha I have like two minutes, so yeah. <laughs> All right, um, but anyways, um, so uh, bad transition to The Floor is Lava, uh, which is a game of lying, backstabbing, betrayal, and murder. Uh, the idea behind this game is, um, uh, and if you play hidden roles games like Werewolf or Mafia, uh, thereabouts, yeah, there you are. Uh, at, at the very least, you probably know what I'm talking about. You know what team you're on, you have no idea what team your friends are on, and you have to figure out who's who or else bad things happen, uh, usually murder. Um, <laughs> and going, this game is no different. The only difference is that this has a physical component. You are on physical islands that are in a room that is full of lava that's made out of rubber because we don't like lawsuits. <laughs> um, and padded Jim's walls friend. because we were designing this for um, military marines and also general public who are sometimes drunk. Um, Do you want me to scroll down? <laughs> but, uh, that, that you, yeah, I mean, you know, do, do what you want. Uh, where where are you located? Uh, I, we are in Hillcrest, which is, for those of you who aren't native of San Diego, literally about an eight, um, a uh, five minute drive uh, north of here. Um, we are actually very, very close by. Um, so yeah, yeah uh, Paul on the bottom, the floor is lava on the top, um, and neither on screen to keep scrolling. Um, but nevertheless, um, um, the, the interesting thing behind our stuff is that um, a lot of the magic sort of co uh, comes, of course, it's powered by Arduino, as is everything these days. Um, but it's all, um, what the part that we find most interesting uh, in these and all these sorts of games is that these games are designed for the normies, uh, for the general public, because um, LARPing is wonderful, but um, it also has something of a stigma um, at, uh, attached to it, um, as Aaron was talking about with earlier, not helped by Hollywood. Um, um, that being said, it uh, turns out if you remove the word role-playing but still toss in role-playing, people will play. Um, and as such, uh, that's what we do at, at, at our sort of escape rooms and other interactive entertainment. The Floor is Lava is actually a board game. Um, horror of horrors. Um, uh, of course, if you call it, tell people it's a board game, they run screaming. But um, what you do is you make the board game and you make it so that it doesn't look like a board game because you're dealt cards, yes, but it's a giant game board that is the size of the room. In fact, the whole room is, is from the uh, size from this wall to that wall. Um, it is a enormous room full of lava of islands that actually sink. Um, and by actually sink, I mean the lights go off. But still, <laughs> but it makes people panic and that's all that's important. Um, <laughs> um, and 
as you all um, uh, furiously hop from one point to another, trying to figure out who's on whose team, and then realizing that, oh, wait, Janice lied to me as she shoves you into the lava. Um, um, uh, to, to, to wrap up, because I know we're all, uh, just about out of time, um, all of you were, um, have, uh, have received uh, free passes to the floor is lava, um, and so I do hope you will come visit us. Um, but anyways. Uh, floor is lava, the puzzle arm. So I, I do want to get a couple questions just for things. So please raise your hand. I'm going to go very quickly on questions. Yes, you, right there. No, just stay where you are. Okay. okay. <laughs> I, I run a comic book company in, in, in the Philippines, and the way I, I interact with people is LARPing. But the thing that I do is one of our characters is like a junk cyborg attorney. So we kind of take the concept of cosplay, which is really welcome in Asia, and we do the whole LARP concept. We actually will do things, and we'll like, I'll be talking, and like, like I'm talking right now, I'll have the character storm in, like literally curse me out, and then start addressing people like, like hey, Bill, and like he's his client, it's really embarrassing. I do that and it makes people uncomfortable, but what are your thoughts on having people LARP, but not even knowing they're LARP? Like yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. Thank you very much. Uh, how do you people know that they're LARPing, but not LARPing? And there's a lot of other terms for it that's coming around. So immersive experiences, immersive entertainment, alternate reality experiences, alternate reality games. They're using stuff like that. And what my sort of hope is take them through it, let them have a great time. And then, oh, by the way, you just LARPed and hit it with them afterwards. So, great question. Do we have any other questions? Because I, I know our time's coming out. Yes. How do, uh, you should please talk to me afterwards because we're done and that's exactly what I'm doing as part of the thing. So, please talk to me afterwards and I'll answer that question because we are done. You got, I think he got a great question right there because he was able to get in there. So. Thank you for your question. Please come up and get your prize, which is one of the sorts. We're going outside. Our, our time is up. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. We have tons of stuff to talk, to talk about. So we're out there. you got postcards. Please meet us out there for anything. Thank you very much for coming to Technology and Live Action Role Playing. Enjoy Comic-Con.